Good morning. I was so excited, I didn't wait till the video was over. I just had to get out here and get started. It's so good to see you in the Lord's house on this first Sunday of the new year. For those of you who make resolutions, and if your resolution was to be in church more this year, you got 100% perfect attendance so far. So you're off to a great, great start, and we're delighted to have you with us. Last week, we let all of our workers, staff, volunteers, and everybody have a Sunday off. Some of you think that's not a big deal. That's because you're not working or serving every Sunday. Hint, hint. And instead, we did at the movie series. I'm just curious, just an informal survey. How many of you watched at the movie with us? Last? Yeah. Okay, good, good. I've uh, gotten a lot of great response from that, and it's something we'll probably experiment with again sometime this year, and um, looking forward to that. But we're glad to have you here. We're back in the one single story, going through the Bible together, a different book each week, and obviously we didn't get through the entire Bible last year, so we're continuing that until we finish up, then we'll start into a new series. And today we're in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we're talking about godly leadership. As we work our way through the message today, he's going to be talking specifically about elders, pastors, deacons, but and we're going to clarify scripturally for you in just a few minutes that every one of us are a leader and an influencer. Somewhere to some degree. Some just have a different literal platform than others, but we all are leaders, and there's some characteristics to godly leaders that we need to be implementing into our lives to become better leaders and better influencers for the kingdom of God. One of the things we're going to discover that it is okay to aspire to be an influencer or a leader. I said it's okay to aspire to be an influencer and a leader. You already are. Don't you want to be a better one? Now, I know for many, many children, and, and I probably fell in this category at some point in time in my early life, where you aspire to become a professional athlete. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> that aspiration has long gone. I realized decades ago that was not going to happen. In this culture in which we live, and the young people understand this more than some of us who have been around a lot longer, is there are a lot of people who have aspirations to be an internet influencer, to influence culture. I, somehow they make a living posting videos and having commentaries and such like things. Some people aspire to become a doctor or a lawyer or perhaps an actor or a politician. They're often one in the same because the folks we elect often act like they care. You know what I'm saying? There was, my wife said, be careful. I heard a story about a man who shared, he said he read an epitaph at a grave one time and on the inscription it said, herein lies an honest man and a politician. He said, imagine that, two people buried in the same grave. <laughs> it's all right to laugh in church. <laughs> Some people, listen, and you can find this real easily. Some people aspire to fame and wealth by going on TV programs such as The Voice or how about this one, American Idol. Listen, I have no interest in either one of those, but if I'm going to watch it at all, at any time, it's going to be in the first two or three episodes at the very beginning when they have the people on there that can't sing a lick. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Where somebody at their household growing up or worse at their local church said, Oh, you sing great. No, you don't. But they aspire through that means many of you have aspired to making New Year's resolutions again by being here. And I'm thankful that you are. And one of the things we often make a resolution is related to how we exercise and eat. And last year this time I, I kind of made a personal <laughs> resolution for myself. And I wanted to lose 10 pounds. And I know you want to know how I, I made out this week. I've only got 15 more pounds to go. 
So there are different things that we aspire to, that we have goals and aspirations. One of those things should be the fact that we can become better leaders and influencers for the kingdom of God. And we do that through our everyday lives. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Paul, who is much older at the time of the writing than Timothy, to whom he writes the letter to, gives this information in the letter. He says, this is a trustworthy or a true saying, if someone aspires to be a church leader. Now, in the context of the original language, he is talking specifically about being a pastor or a bishop or an elder or, or some other interchangeable terminology that would talk about somebody who has the, the ultimate responsibility of leading a church or a congregation. We're going to see in just a minute, it's applicable to all of us, though. Let's read on. He says, if someone aspires to be a church leader at any level, at any degree, he desires an honorable position. Well, if he says there is an honorable position to be desired, doesn't it logically make sense that there are dishonorable positions of influence that we can aspire to have? He says, There is an honorable position and we should aspire to it. I want to draw your attention for just a moment and then we're going to move on with the, with the message. But I want to make this point crystal clear that we all are leaders and influencers. I don't want to spend this time together with this message and you leave out of here and say, well, I'm not, I'm not a pastor, never going to be a pastor, I'm not a deacon, not an elder. None of those play, things apply to me. Well, they absolutely all apply to us. Now, I want to make this crystal clear. Go with me for just a moment to 1 Peter chapter 2 want to resolve or settle this issue in your minds for you that we all are leaders and been called by God and all the things that Paul writes in the letter to Timothy are applicable to us. He says in 1 Peter chapter 2 beginning at verse 4, he says, you are coming to Christ, literally conversion, salvation, you have been transformed. If you are a believer today, if you are a disciple of Christ in any shape, form or fashion, you have a responsibility to be a godly leader. Let's read on. We'll prove it. He said, you are coming to Christ who is the living cornerstone of God's temple or his church or his kingdom. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. Verse 5. And you, insert yourself, your name into this passage right now. He says, you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple temple, into his church, into his kingdom, here it is, what's more, you are, not will be, you are, if you are a believer, if you are a Christ follower, a disciple, if you have experienced salvation, the rebirth, you are his holy priest. Now, we don't have time to go back and talk about priests in the Old Testament. Their primary responsibility was communicate with God and communicate to the people, to serve God and to serve people. You and I are priests. It's often referred to as the priesthood of all believers. Again, if you are saved, if you are a believer, if you are a disciple, a Christ follower, you are an influencer, good or bad, for the kingdom of God. And, and these principles we're going to examine today will help us become better leaders and influencers. He says, and through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. What might that look like on a practical level? Simple things that we do such as prayer and worship, fasting, serving, giving, living, and, and leading other people, influencing. Now, with that established, let's go back to our, our text. Pick back up at 1 Timothy 3. He says, So a church leader must be a man or, or an individual whose life is above, and the first thing he notes that he puts in here, he says, whose life is above reproach. What does that mean? It means that you are not currently living in a lifestyle or situation that brings discredit or disgrace to you and or the church or the kingdom of God. Now, what he is not saying, and he doesn't say it anywhere in this passage, and we ought to be thankful for that, he never says that we have to be perfect people. How many of you, along with me, will acknowledge, I'm glad that's not a requirement to be an influencer in the kingdom of God is to be perfect because all of us would be out. 
But the first thing he says in this list, he says, is a person whose life is above reproach. In other words, they are not practicing sin. They may struggle with it from time to time. Proverbs 14.34 says it this way, that sin is a reproach to any person or any people. In a our culture today, even within the church, oftentimes when you preach and teach from the Word of God, there will be issues that arise that people push back on because it's not what they like or what they want to approve of or what makes them feel good, but the truth is the truth and will not deviate from it. Our job is to teach and preach and to follow the truth because if we act like it doesn't matter how we live, the scripture just told us that sin is a reproach to any people, including the church. We have a responsibility. He says, he goes on, he says, he must be faithful to his wife, to his spouse. I put this in my notes, this is so important. Relational faithfulness is a measure of our faithfulness to God. Hmm. I might come down for this one. Our faithfulness as it relates to our relationships, beginning with, with our spouse first, with our children and family, but also with our friends and our fellow worshipers in the house of God, our faithfulness to each other in those relationships are a direct reflection of our relationship with God. I knew this wouldn't be a popular message today, but it's okay. You want me to move on, don't you? He says you need to live a life above reproach. You must be faithful in your relationships. And he must exercise, and I just soon he left this one out, you must exercise self-control. As we go into the new year, Take out of your vocabulary words and phrases that sound like this. You made me fill in the blank. If you hadn't said that or done that, I wouldn't have done this. Because when we stand before God Almighty on Judgment Day, I'm not going to be able to say... Well, if, if Tommy Davis hadn't have treated me that way and left me out or said that about my preaching too long, <laughs> Anita said that was his wife said that. <laughs> How I respond to that is my responsibility. Is this practical? He must exercise self-control, meaning you must be disciplined both in your mind and your body, which includes your mouth. Whew. What else do we need to be responsible for if we're going to be better leaders and godly leaders and influencers other than being above reproach and faithful in our relationships and having self-control? He said we must live wisely versus living foolishly and must have a good reputation. I'm going to say this, and I mean it with all sincerity. Some of us may have to start that process today. Here's the reality. All of us have a reputation. Some of you are looking at me like, I, I don't have a reputation. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> I'll help you with it. I'll fill you in. <laughs> Reputations are built over time. They are demonstrated. They are lived out. And so listen, if you're in the house today and you're new to the faith or you come to know Jesus before this service is over and you said, you know what, my past reputation isn't very good. In fact, it's not good at all. That's okay. You begin today. He says, self-control, live wisely, develop, build, have a good reputation. Here's another one. 
he must enjoy having guests in his home. Meaning you must have some sense of hospitality toward people. Now I know some of you are saying, well, listen, I thought about volunteering in some area of the church, but now that you just read that, I don't want people to come to my house because I had to clean it. Listen, it's great to have people in your house, but listen, here, here is the root of what he's saying here in being hospitable is that you are willing to invest a little bit of time and effort into developing deeper relationships with people. Do you see that? Whether it's at your home, at their home, whether it's at the local restaurant, it, it really doesn't matter, but you're willing to invest time, effort, and energy in relationships. Next, he says, remember this is a letter he's laying out these guidelines to Timothy, he says, and he must be able to teach. Every one of us are teachers. Every one of us are teachers. If you are an influencer, if you are a leader, you are teaching people that are watching you. Now, you may be teaching them things and behaviors and habits that they ought not learn. But we all are teachers. I, I, I'm thinking about a story of, of a dear friend of mine who a few years ago shared with me. He, he said, uh, this, I was out in, in the building and he said, my, my son who was, I don't know, I don't know if he was a teenager at that time or not, had gotten into something... And the daddy discovered the son, and he got upset and threatened to punish severely the son for a behavior that the daddy was doing himself. And the conversation went something like, I don't know what I'm going to do without what I'll tell you one thing. I threatened to beat him right there on the spot when I felt like I was scared. And I said, you know I love you, don't you? He said, yeah, yeah, you're one of my best friends. I said, for right now. I said, are you still doing that? Well, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes. I said, but you need to be quiet and you need to apologize to the boy for the way you acted to him. Because we are teaching people, why do we have expectations of other people greater than we do ourselves? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Paul said to Timothy, he said, before you're going to lead a church, before you're going to lead a congregation, before you're going to lead your family, before you're going to lead the neighborhood and, and your neighbors and, and people that, that you work with, he said, there's some things you've got to work on yourself. So you've got to be able to teach, demonstrate good, but you have to be teachable. Don't look at anybody you wrote here with today, but do you know people that you can't tell them nothing? Yeah, we all do, don't we? You're thinking of two or three right now. I saw a couple elbows go, hmm. You have to be teachable to be able to teach something else and someone else. He says those are characteristics of, of good and godly leaders. Verse 3, some of you are going to like this verse. <laughs> he must not be a heavy drinker. And you say, oh, wait a minute, you tell me I can drink and, and, and be a leader and be an influencer too. He said, I, I think I like this Christianity stuff. <laughs> Listen to what the scripture says. He says he must, he must not be a heavy drinker. Now let me establish this 100% right out of the gate. In scripture, in the Bible, throughout the Bible, drunkenness is always classified as sin. I did not say alcohol was sin. I said drunkenness is a sin. You can be drunk on alcohol. You can be drunk on illicit or prescription drugs. I'll wait for you to get back to reality. You can be influenced by social media. Ooh. He said, literally what he's saying is, he said, whether it's alcohol or anything else, he said, you cannot live your life operating under the influence of things outside of God's purview in his word. 
which encompasses a lot of things, not just alcohol. Notice, and he says, so not be a heavy drinker or be violent. Not be physically violent with people. Not to be verbally violent with people. Not to be emotionally violent and rip people apart. Listen, I I want you to get in your mind the word pictures. We go through this message today as as having some type of, of ladder here where we are progressing in our ability to be influencers and godly leaders at whatever level and raising that bar and that standard. And every one of these would represent a peg in that. That is, we work on those issues. The Lord will bless us and allow us to become better influencers and leaders. Do you, do you see that word picture? And the lack of any of these push us back down. John Maxwell, in one of his leadership books, uses the term the law of the lid. There are absolutely some behaviors and attitudes and lifestyles that if we choose to live them and don't get them under control of the power of the Holy Spirit, that our lid of influence, our sphere of influence will always be very, very low. But as we work on this that he's sharing with us, the influence level rises rapidly. Let's read on. In case you're thinking, you had not got me yet, well, hold on. He must be gentle, not quarrelsome. I don't know if Paul's definition and my definition with her are the same as relates to quarrelsome. But here's a word of caution, particularly for you married people. Don't try to regulate your spouse with this list. It won't end well for you. And you're responsible for you. Be gentle, not quarrelsome. He says, and not love money. Notice he did not say, and not have any money. He said, not love it. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, the motivation behind it. I'm going to get right out there on the edge now, taking the risk of, of offending even more people than I already have. If you are greedy and selfish and never give and never express generosity, you are bound by the love of money. Verse 4. He must manage his own family well. Having children who respect and obey him. Why is that so important? The proof of the demonstration of your um, management ability is in your family. I really need about three or four weeks to do this justice, but, but we're just we're going to skim it and, and keep going. We've got a lot of ground to cover. He says, verse 5, for if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church, which is a whole lot of households, right? Verse 6, a church leader, whether it's a bishop, whether it's a priest, whether it's a pastor, whether it's an elder, whether it's a deacon, whether it is a volunteer, whether it is a believer, which is all of us, all of those we're putting in there, must not be a new believer if you're going to assume great responsibility. Doesn't that seem very logical? There's some practical reasons for that. He says because, and the first one I want to talk about is because there's a lot of things we don't know. Would it make any sense... For someone, and I pray that that we have some of those decisions today where people make a first-time decision to come to know Jesus today in this house. Change your eternal destiny. But it would be foolish if that were to take place next week to invite them to preach the message. Wouldn't it? I mean, it, it seems obvious. 
let, me, let me share this practical, I think, illustration that may help us understand this even better. If, let's say, tomorrow I decided I was going to go get a, a secular job out, outside of the church, and somebody said to me, hey, I know, I know a place that's hiring. It happens to be a local nuclear plant. They're hiring people over there, and I think if you go over there, you might can get a job. But let me tell you, if I go over to the local nuclear plant, there are some things that I could do and do safely and do well. First of all, I could clean the floors and the bathrooms and do a great job with it. And everything is lovely. I think I could even work at the front desk where people might come in and say, Good morning, it's so good to see you. Hi. How may I direct your call? I think I could do those things and, and no harm that I actually believe with my qualifications and experience, I think I could work security at a nuclear power plant and get along just fine and be an asset. But do you notice the levels of responsibility that I'm demonstrating in this story? You, do you see it? Cleaning, front desk, security. Now let me tell you the job that I'm not going to do, that I'm not qualified, I'm not even going to get offered, is to work inside where, where the reactors are. Where all that science stuff is taking place. Because we'd soon have a meltdown and blow the place up. And that's what happens when we put people in positions of authority before they are prepared for it. We melt the place down or blow it up. Not only in the church house, but in seats of government, at all levels, it, it is dangerous. One, he said, a, a, a church leader full of responsibility can't or shouldn't because, one, is because they don't know a lot of things yet, and he says, and they might become proud. Arrogant. I have known people through the years that were some of the nicest, humble, gentle people until they got a title. And even if their job responsibilities didn't change one bit, the, the title phew, went to their head and they became a different person. They morphed into something ugly. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? He says... And the devil would cause him to fall. Also, people outside the church must speak well of him. I think therein lies the real test. You folks see me and hear me pretty much on a weekly basis, but it's very limited. The real test is, what do people who have known me for 30, 40, 50 years, who worked with me in previous careers, people who live in my neighborhood, people who are my family, what do they say about me? That's probably a greater measure of who I really am than what even you may think because of this limited basis. He says, and people outside the church must speak well of people who are in positions of authority so they will not disgrace or be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. So we got two extremes. You can become proud or you can become disgraced, and neither one of them are very good. Now, we've got a few more verses. Hang in there with me as we talk about a little bit more about leadership. We're in verse 8, 1 Timothy Chapter 3, he said, in the same way, and now he's going to a different category, different level, different rung of leadership and authority, even within the church. He said, in the same way, deacons. And I, and I want you to understand what that word literally means in the Greek, diakonos, means a servant, a minister, a waiter. More than any place on the planet inside the church, the higher responsibility you have, the greater your servant heart has to be. 
doesn't always work that way outside the church, but inside the church it's paramount that it does work that way. He said, in the same way, deacons, those who are servers, those who are given of themselves to the work of, of the house of God and to the kingdom of God, must be well respected and have integrity. I love these definitions of integrity. One is a strong, strong and honest moral mindset. Another one, to be integrated, means to be whole and not divided, to be well balanced. But I love this is my favorite one. Means to this word integrity means to be incapable of not being trusted. That's powerful. And, and I'm gonna be 100 percent real and transparent with you right now. There are people that I know and have known that if somebody said to me or I overheard that this person said or did this, I'd be thinking, even if I didn't say it, I'd be thinking, hey, no doubt, I'm surprised they didn't do worse than that. Because they've proven that. You understand what I'm saying? There are some people that I know at another level that if somebody made accusations against them, I'd be going like, mm, I'd be thinking, mm. I'm not so sure about that. I, that seems out of character. I don't, I don't know. I'm just not real sure about that. Then there are people who meet this definition. They are incapable of not being trusted. That if people said something about them, that I'd immediately would say, I do not believe it unless they tell me themselves. See, we want to live our lives where we become those people. Where if somebody says, hey, well, you ain't going to believe what Doug did. He sold me some eggs, and he knew they were rotten. <laughs> he just trying to clean out his inventory at the beginning of the year. And I say, 100%, I do not believe that he did that, and if he did it, it wasn't intentional. You see the difference? I had somebody to call me, and this has been a long time ago, and it wasn't any of you in here. Somebody called me and wanted me to listen to their story about an encounter they had with someone else that I knew very well for a long time. They said, I just randomly saw this person and they named the location where they were at. And they said, I didn't even say anything to the person. All of a sudden, they stopped as we passed each other. And they looked at me, and they began to tell me in the, in the, in the language coming out of the person's mouth. I was just like, oh, my God, I know that this is not true. Because this person that I knew met this definition, incapable of not being trusted. And I listened to that for about two or three minutes till they caught their breath. I said, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me jump in the conversation. I said, to my knowledge, I've never met you and you've never met me. Am I right? And they said, yeah, 100% right. I said, but I already know something about you. And they said, what's that? that you're? And I said, I know that you're a liar. Because I know that person that well. They're incapable of that. I said, now, if you insist on sticking to this story, for whatever your motivation I will be glad to arrange a meeting with me and you and that person's face-to-face -face so we're all three together at the same time. And they said, clear. End of story. Listen, that's the kind of life we want to live. If somebody says something, you hear something, you say, I don't believe that for one minute. Ain't even going to waste my time. On it because they have integrity. It says they must not be heavy drinkers or dishonest with money. They must be committed to the mystery of the faith that's now revealed. Literally, what he's saying is they got to live out to the best of their ability what they know right now based on scripture. Now, let me put this caveat in. If you've been serving the Lord for 40 years, you ought to be further down the road than the person who's only been serving him for two years. Your knowledge base had had increase to the degree that your responsibility and accountability has increased. Are you with me? <laughs> he says, based on what's been revealed, and they must live with a clear conscience. What does that mean? Does it mean they're not going to make mistakes? No. Does it mean they're perfect? No. It doesn't mean that at all. What does it mean? He says, live with a clear conscience. It means that they are man or woman enough to go to an individual and say, we need to talk about this. I want to talk about this. I want to apologize. I want to make this right. I want to move forward. A 
until you and I become mature enough, whether it's in this church, whether it's in your home, whether it's at your job, to make things right with other people, I promise you, your influence is going to stay very low where it's at now. He said, if you're, if you're going to arise to a level of influence in the kingdom of God, he said, you've got to be willing to keep short accounts. You've got to be able to go and resolve issues and conflict, be willing to make things right. Listen, making somebody needs to hear this. Making things right does not mean that you prove you are right. If you don't leave with anything else today, that's worth writing down right there. Your willingness to make things right does not mean that you have to prove you're right. He says, verse 10, Before they are appointed as deacons, let them be closely examined. If they pass the test, let them serve as deacons in the same way. Their wives must be respected or respectable and must not slander others. That means to defame, discredit, dishonor. Because if you do, then that's a disqualifier. They must exercise self-control and be faithful in everything they do. Here's a question I want you to ponder today. Are you, not, not the person you came with, not the person you're married to, are you a disqualifier to the influence and the blessings of somebody else around you? Because here's the reality of it. My wife and I both often tell you we are far from perfect people and I stand here almost every week and confess something to you that I got wrong, I messed up, I need to work on, I need to repent, I need to pray about. But listen, I can rise no higher in leadership and and authority in the house of God than what her ability to stay with me is. And by staying with me, I mean running a parallel course. She absolutely can engage in behaviors and attitudes and actions that can keep me from doing what I'm doing now and vice versa. Oh, I feel this so strong right now. There are people around you in your circle that God wants to elevate their influence and their ability to lead and help people in the kingdom of God and they can't rise above your level. Who are you disqualifying today? Who are you holding back from becoming what God wants them to be? Greg, you can come on. We're we're wrapping this up. He goes on to say here at the very end, he says, A deacon, a leader must be faithful, must manage his children. This is a repeat of, of the previous ones even though these are different levels. He said, and those who do well will be rewarded. Do you understand that anything we do for the kingdom of God, we do it for the right attitude and the right motive, there's always a reward attached to it. You can't get away from it. That's the scriptural principle all throughout. One of the ways, he says, you'll be rewarded with respect from others and will have increased confidence in their faith in Christ Jesus you want to increase your faith you want to experience more of the presence the power and the joy and the love and the peace of God in your life learn to be a servant leader whether you ever have a position or title is irrelevant but the people who are already in your circle Learn to live out these principles to increase your influence and to create an opportunity for God to give you more responsibility. The greater responsibility always comes with more challenges. (laughs) Listen, I I have talked to people before. I said, hey, here's a great opportunity. I think you're gifted in this area. I think you'd be great at it. No, I like just sitting here and just doing my thing, being responsible for me and nobody else. (laughs) 
We all have gifts, talents, and abilities as well as resources that God said, I, I want you to bless my church with that. I want you to encourage other people. I want you to teach and influence other people. If you have children, I don't care what the ages are, 100%, you and I, because I'm in that category of children and grandchildren, 100%, you can and should become a better influence and leader to them. If you work, if you go out in public, if you're breathing, you should become a better influencer and leader for the kingdom of God. Paul, he set out this list. He said, there's some things, there are expectations that God has of us that he wants us to implement. And I'm going to ask you to put up on that screen this, this list. This is a summary of, of the list. He said, live a life above reproach. Be faithful in your relationships. Exercise self-control. Live wisely. Develop a good reputation. Be hospitable to people. Be teachable and willing to teach other people. Be gentle and not quarrelsome in your responses. Be a good manager. Live a life of integrity. And be committed to your faith and not be someone else's disqualifier. Now, now here's your chance to respond to this message. If there is a single or multiple areas of this list that you'll be honest with yourself and God and say, you know what, I'm I really, really bad at that one. I need to improve in that one. Maybe you, like me, said there's about six of them up there. I need, I need to improve in dramatically. If there's a singular, doesn't matter, one or more area on that list that you say, you know what, I need to and can do a better job with God's help. And you mean that. I want you to stand right now. We're getting ready to pray. If there's a single area listed up there that you need to do better in. And don't you stand because everybody else is standing. I knew this would be the response because here's the reality of it. We all struggle in some areas, don't we? There's some areas we don't get it right. Some areas we don't, we don't get right very often at all. Some we get right most of the time, but not all the time. This message isn't just about pastors and or deacons or elders. This, this message is about every one of us. Living according to the truth of Scripture to the level that we become greater influencers and greater leaders to the people around us. Join me as we pray. And I, I believe God's going to honor your heart and your obedience by standing in acknowledgement to say, there are some areas I need to work on. I need to surrender to God. Holy Father, as we linger in your presence now, I thank you for the truth and the simplicity of your word that you have shared with these people today. That we all have a responsibility to be influencers and leaders in your kingdom. Lord, there are many of us in this place today that need to be better leaders in our homes, with our spouses, with our families. Many of us need to be better influencers and leaders at our places of work, in our neighborhoods, even at the stores that we may go to to conduct business. We need to have a godly influence with the people around us. Lord, we've acknowledged, as most all the people in this house have today, that we don't always get it right. And Lord, I confess before you and before these people, there are many of these categories that I struggle with from time to time. But Lord, yet we've acknowledged them. And as we stand as a group of people today, we offer ourselves, we say, Lord, we confess, we acknowledge, we ask for your forgiveness, and we ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to indwell our hearts, our minds, our spirits, our emotions in such a way that we begin to improve and develop and mature in every area and aspect 
that you have shared with us today by the power of your word. Thank you that you are good and gracious, God. And even though we have many failures and faults and struggles and even at times sin in our lives, that you are God of grace and mercy and forgiveness and restoration. And Lord, for the individual who stands here today and has heard this message and their heart has been touched by the power of your Holy Spirit and yet they say, if you only knew my past, if you knew where I've been and what I've done, you would understand there's no hope for me. My reputation is is too tainted, it's too dirty. Remind them today, right now, by the power of your Spirit and your presence that when they come to you, they become a brand new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. That our past is forgiven and put away, and you give us a brand new, clean start. For that, we are grateful and thankful. We rejoice and we look forward, Lord, as you continue to work in our lives as individuals and corporately as a church body to become greater influencers and greater leaders for the kingdom of God. These things we pray and give thanks now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for just a couple minutes, please, if you'll just be seated. As Greg continues to play, the folks before you today, and I thought how appropriate this first day of the year, and that we were already had outlined for this passage to be where we would preach from today. And we wanted to take this time today to bring all of these people before you today. One, we're going to pray for them in just a minute, but we, as we go into this new year, are going to ordain them. We're going to set them apart for service in the kingdom of God. They serve in various capacities. Let me start down to my right, your left, all the way down. We have Robert and Penny Harmon. Robert serves as an elder here that represents the Bertie Campus Church, he and his wife, Penny. Then we have Doug and Judy Mazzell who have served and are continuing to serve this year as deacons for our church. Remember what I told you about the definition of deacon? It means a waiter, it means a servant. And as I go down this list, I'm almost guaranteed that you're going to look at these people and say, oh yeah, I see them do stuff all the time. Well, that's why they're deacons. Because they, they are servants to the kingdom of God. They're servants to me in the sense of they they take a lot off my plate. They share a lot of my burdens and a lot of my load. They do a lot of the practical stuff for and with and around the church. And I'm so grateful for them. They are servants. Next we have Pam and Vernon White who have been with us for quite some time. We have Perry and Kristen that have served. This is the second, third year you've been, yeah, been with somehow he slipped through the cracks again. I'm just no I'm just kidding. <laughs> Appreciate the Britons and their service. Um, seated right right down here, I hope you can see most of the top of her head. It's Miss Sharon Schwartz, and uh, she has, yeah. You, she, she is a miracle. As many of you know her story, recently developing liver disease and has had a transplant and has done phenomenally well in the back in church and um, we want to acknowledge her and recognize her and even though she served in this capacity for a long time to ordain her as the children's pastor and and make that acknowledgement along with all of these people who are servants and then right beside her we have Don and Connie Smithwick that we love and appreciate and served here for a long time they've been a part of this church from the very beginning and then we have Mamie and Justin Shambly and I'm grateful for them. They have a servant's heart and already serving in many capacities. I'm excited to have them on board with us as deacons. Then we have Jeremy and Gretchen Reed serving. They serve in other capacities too, but they're going to be serving as deacons. And for those of you who don't know Jeremy, one, it's a good thing that you don't know him outside the church in that capacity. Two, in, in Paul's letter to Timothy, he, he laid this thing out, but he, he didn't set necessarily, he didn't set hard limits in, in punishments and judgments. Well, Jeremy will help you with that <laughs> as it relates to certain things of the law. 
But we're grateful for their heart and their passion to serve. And they're coming on as deacons this year. And also Tom and Adria Keenan. And they've been with us for quite some time. And, and the thing that I've noticed about the both of them is, man, they're just willing to do whatever needs to be done. They get involved in all kinds of ministries, fill in the gaps, step up when people can't. And, and that's really... That's really what a deacon is. That's really what any of us should be willing to do. Is say, hey, can I help with something? I had a couple of people come to me this morning, and they just walked up to me. They said, hey, I just want to ask you a simple question. Anything I can help you with this morning? That's all. I so appreciated that. The more we do, the more there is to be done. Do you have the passage, Acts 6? that you can pull up real quick. It's okay. It's okay. The passage in Acts 6 simply says that as the church began to multiply, listen to me, it said as the church began to grow and multiply rapidly, it said so did the discontent. Can I tell you one of the greatest dangers to rapid church growth is discontent among people? Because everybody who comes in those doors has an opinion. Yes, you do. About everything. He says, as the church grew rapidly, multiplied, said, so the discontent. And he gives one example. He said, this group said, well, we won't get treated the same as this group over here, blah, 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 blah. And he said, you know what? He said, as apostles, and, and I'm going to say as a pastor... I ought to be spending my time praying and interceding and getting the Word of God to share with people. That's my primary responsibility. In fact, go back and read Acts chapter 6 when you get home. And he said, he said we, we ought not be spending our time waiting on tables and serving people in a meal program. He said, we got the truth of the Word to study and preach and teach and develop leaders. He said, so let us choose out among us a group of people. He said, that can do those things so that I as apostle, as, as the writer said, can focus on what I've been called to do. And listen, that's what these people right here helped me with so very much. And I thank you for all of you who volunteer and serve in whatever capacity. And I want you right now, we're getting ready to pray for them and over them. Oh, I am so sorry. Jennifer, you're behind me. I didn't see you. And, and Jennifer Jackson here on the stage with us as our worship leader. I want her to be included in this. And I apologize. I was looking down there. <laughs> and as we pray, I, I'm going to ask you to do something that you may or may not be comfortable with, but do it anyway. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to stretch your hand forward toward these people. As we pray over them for God's blessing, His favor, Jennifer, all this team that's in front of us, you just want to step up a little bit there, Jim. For the presence and the power of God upon their lives to live out these principles that Paul outlined in this letter so that we can be better influencers, better leaders for the kingdom of God. Join me as we pray. Father, I thank you for men and women who are willing to be servants for you. I thank you for people who are willing to sacrifice their time, their resources, their gifts, talents, and abilities. To willingly take on a role that by its very definition says, I'm willing to be a servant. I'm willing to put my own selfish desires aside and become an influencer for the kingdom of God. I'm willing to give my life for other people. All the way down from Miss Sharon with the children. To Jennifer with the music and the praise and the worship. To all of these men and women who stand as your servants. I pray for a greater 
anointing on their life. I pray for uncommon wisdom for them to be able to think and to reason, to solve complex issues. I pray for favor on them and blessings in their home for help and strength. I pray for blessings on their finances, upon their children and all of their relationships, upon their businesses, upon their jobs, every facet of their life as they serve. Lord, you said there's a reward attached to genuine servanthood. I pray that you'd pour out your blessings on them. May they become great and powerful influencers in this church, in this community, in this county, in this region for the glory of God. And Lord, I pray that this message would permeate beyond this group here to every seat in this house today that will recognize the significance and importance of serving you and giving you our very best to the glory and the honor of God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God, stay in place just a second. Wade, would you help me with this? Just, just start if you'll tote the box. Just want to present these certificates of ordination. I figured somebody might want a picture of me. I'm just, <laughs> just let's get one for the church. <laughs> she, said, she said, I'm good. <laughs> Pam, right here. Vernon, thank you guys. Here, 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 let me, let me, let me take a picture right here. Jeremy and Gretchen, thank you so very much. Justin and Randy. Adrian and Tom, thank you guys for your service. Honey, oh, right here. <laughs> you know why I need people helping me. Don, thank you. Judy, Robert, we'll look for yours. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give them a great big hand this morning? All of them. Jennifer, thank you. Now listen, guys, there's some, uh, there's some sp- i tell you what, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let you go. Go ahead. But I want this group to sing. Because, listen, there, you, you, can, you can go back to your seats or your area of service, wherever you need to be. I've asked Jennifer and the team to come back and to sing this song. Because to me, this is a song about surrender, giving yourself back to God in, in service to become a greater influencer and a leader for the kingdom of God. I want you to worship with them. Go ahead and stand. You've been seated for a while. Let's come on and stand. And as they sing this, I want you to sing it with them and mean it from your heart as a prayer of surrender and commitment in your life back to God.